what is probability theory and what does it have to do with political science? This is an excellent question, one that I hear from both my students and myself as I grapple with consuming and producing research related to politics and international relations. So I wanted to take a few minutes in this video to kind of go through the few key assumptions underlying um, probability theory, um, the central limit theorem, and some basic statistics that probability theory uh, enables us to talk about means, standard deviations, standard errors, confidence intervals that enable us to understand and interpret the research that is being produced by others, as well as to be able to wrap our heads around what our results are actually telling us. So let's dig into it. The first major question is, what is probability? Probability, this quote from Whelan says, is the study of events and outcomes involving an element of uncertainty. And this is a crucial thing that differentiates the social sciences from potentially other fields of study. That in social science, when we're studying human beings and their institutions, this is a probabilistic universe. There are a whole lot of us. We have various different interests and uh, constraints and opportunities. It, political institutions, social, cultural, educational, and otherwise. And so when all of us come together and interact to be able to distribute scarce goods or to be able to try to get other people to do what we would want or to be able to get what we want, there is an element of uncertainty in what is likely to happen from that. And uncertainty and probabilities have been used to try to understand a whole bunch of different outcomes from just on the left, how many different white beads are there in the picture. So to if you flip a coin, what is the likelihood of getting a heads or a tails if you flip one time, 10 times, a thousand times, or if you choose a pack of cards and, and try to figure out what is the chance of pulling out the ace of spades. All of these, when you talk about chance, uncertainty, and probabilities, there are a couple of assumptions that we're making when we're talking about them. So let's get into that. Um, first, why uh, should we care uh, about probabilities? I, I think because again, we're dealing with uncertainty and imperfect information. We don't have unlimited time and funds to be able to uh, survey every single person in the country to try to figure out what they want or who they're gonna vote for in the next election. We can get some smaller part of that group, a sample, and try to measure either what they do or what they believe or what they think about the world, and then try to connect what we learn about that sample to what we think the underlying larger population might also believe. So a, a lot of time we're dealing with samples in our empirical research. We don't have the entire population. And so we have that gap between the sample, um, which is within that larger population. And so we have to try to make that link between the sample and the population. This we often do in trying to use the word statistical significance, that if we have a relationship that is statistically significant, that means that we have some faith that there is an, in, uh, a lack of a relationship between our independent and dependent variable. There is an underlying relationship there, and there are different thresholds and different statistics that we use. But in probability theory, that helps drive our ability to say a relationship is statistically significant. Um, so what, how confident are, uh, are we that our results are not just due to random chance? So in this video, I want to talk about just a, a couple of key terms. Can't cover it all. There are lots of videos on YouTube on these as well as uh, other more advanced topics, but I want to just cover a couple of essentials that I think politics and international relations students at both the undergraduate and graduate level will find useful and will keep coming back to. First is uh, the key properties of uh, probabilities the central limit theorem, the standard normal distribution, and uh, confidence intervals around an estimated uh, mean. Uh, 
uh, sample mean and expected values uh, given our understanding of the probability of different outcomes actually happening. So I want to just try to cover those five limited uh, elements in this video. So first, let's start with the probabilities key properties. First, an outcome, all outcomes have a probability ranging between zero and one. Keeps it simple um, mathematically as well as conceptually, that if you have a six-sided die here, each one of the probabilities of rolling the die and getting the number between one and six, if you sum all those different probabilities together, they will sum up to be one, but each one of those probabilities lay between zero uh, and one. So if you see here a graph on the right, then if you throw a die, you have scores between one and six, and this is a uniform distribution. You should, with a fair die, have an equal chance of rolling a one, two, three, four, five, and six. And if you sum all those probabilities together, you will get one. And for each of these different values, the basic probability of getting one of those values is the number of relevant outcomes, in this case one, one of the different sides values, over the total number of possible outcomes, in this case six, right? Um, all these different probabilities have to sum to one. The probabilities of each one of these outcomes is between zero and one. If you sum them all together, they must be exactly one. So if you sum the probabilities of all these different sides of the die, you will get one. Third key property I wanted to touch on, if and only if two outcomes are independent from each other, the probabilities of both of those events uh, occurring um, it are equal to the product of each one of those different things occurring. So if me and my friend Sajad both have a die and we roll, um, I want to see my probability of rolling a three and Sajad rolling a six at the same time. We multiply those two different pr uh, probabilities together. So that's 0.167 for me rolling a three, 0.167 for Sajad rolling a six. The product of that is 0 0.028. So that means a little bit less than a 3% chance of both of us rolling those particular values. So if you wanted to look at the um, joint probability of two end independent things happening, you multiply those uh, two uh, terms. The chance of either one of those things happening is the sum of those two probabilities if those options are mutually exclusive. So the chance of either rolling a three or a six by me is the sum of the probability of a three and the probability of a six, right? And that is only if um, those are two mutually exclusive options, both having their own distinctive probability value. The fifth basic uh, key property of probability, if the events are not mutually exclusive, the probability of getting an either one of those different things is the sum of those individual probabilities minus the probability of both of those things happening. The die uh, example kind of falls apart there, but if you have um, two things that are not mutually exclusive, that basically means that both uh, one of those things, those both of those things can happen at the same time because of those earlier statements that the probabilities are between zero and one and all of them have to add up to be exactly one. If there's a third option, let's say you're flipping a coin and you think that there's only two options, zero and one. However, I've seen enough random videos on TikTok or YouTube or whatever in which a coin can land on its side. So that might be a very small probability. Uh, a third probability that I guess is technically in this case both heads and tails, then you would want to incorporate that probability when you're calculating the probabilities of heads, tails, and both so that they can both sum into one. And so that means you have to take away some of the probability that you had assumed uh, was going towards either heads or tails to be able to point uh, and put towards that highly unlikely third outcome. So the if the events are not mutually exclusive, then you have to get the probability uh, of getting one or the other is the sum minus the probability of getting both at the same time. That one, I think, is less relevant because we often assume that our different outcomes that we're studying are mutually exclusive. 
like with anything in social science, what we're doing is involving a series of trade-offs, strengths and weaknesses, assumptions that might fit better or worse in certain situations. So I wanted to highlight from the top a couple of pitfalls that people fall into when they talk about probabilities or when they use probabilities to try to explain the world around them. The first is when they assume independent uh, events are independent when they actually are not. For example, rain today and rain tomorrow, there could be a larger weather system that is causing uh, a longer term rain event that would affect the probability of rain both today and tomorrow. Those things are not independent because of the underlying factor that's driving the probability of both of those different events. Contrasting this is the opposite direction. You can assume events that are not independent when they actually are. People who play sports will often fall um, prey to this, assuming that they're on a hot streak in which your chance of scoring the next three-point shot is affected by the your chance of, um, or whether you've uh, made your shot before or the one you're likely to make in the, in the future. The next potential pitfall is understanding or not understanding that clusters do happen. One of the previous weeks in this class, we talked about how there was one poor gentleman who was struck by lightning seven times before dying. I've read in the Canberra Times a couple of examples of people who've won the lottery multiple times. So there are um, statistically unlikely clusters of these events happen just because of the nature of um, uh, events reoccurring over, uh, repeatedly, um, outliers or clusters can actually happen. The next is not fully understanding reversion to the mean, that if you look at your grade for a particular exam or for a particular course, you might do better or worse in that than you might expect or that you might um, compare against what you've done in in um, in other events um, or just there's a whole bunch of different examples of this that you have outliers the next um, uh, the overall distribution of the events the 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 mean value is is having this pull towards because of just the basic frequency distribution so that um, so like you look at um, Transcripts for undergraduate students. I've done, I've seen this a bunch of times with students applying to graduate school uh, or wanting a letter of recommendation that you do see marks and they could have an overall trajectory up, down, or staying the same. However, there might be those potential outliers in one class because of a, a professor was potentially easier or harder, or the student had a difficult term. There was other things going on. They took a whole bunch of classes that term, um, but that was an outlier and there was um, in the end uh, a regression uh, to the mean um, measuring that underlying ability in that case but also with um, values for a lot of the things that we look at. Next, uh, next potential pitfall is moving from aggregate statistics to try to pre uh, predict what one individual is likely to do. There is a whole literature on the ecological fallacy uh, if you're interested but you can think of examples of police profiling or others that look at aggregate statistics of the likelihood of something happening amongst a particular group and then seeing one particular med, uh, individual of that group and assuming um, because the probabilities in the group might be a certain way that that person might have the characteristics uh, that might be of the group uh, might not apply at the individual. So you have to be careful when you're trying to look at specific events using aggregate level um, analysis. Six is a broader challenge for data quality. We've talked previously in this course about issues of measurement error, whether they could be systematic or random. If you put garbage in data that has a systematic or uh, systematic bias or just a large amount of noise around the estimate, then the statistics you generate using those data are also going to be problematic and potentially biased. Seventh um, is something that I've been thinking about um, 
given the speed in which I've seen the analytical tools that are based on these foundations that were established centuries ago, probability, means, standard deviations, and such, that you have these cornerstones of probability, ordinary least squares, that are being used in new ways um, that might have fancy terms like machine learning or AI that are basically much more complicated and harder to explain to the layperson, you might not understand what's actually going on in the hood to the point where you're not exactly sure what to do with the results as well as how to try to understand how well it could explain black swan or atypical events. People often talk about black swan events that they take to mean that the the models that people use to explain average values or the central tendency don't apply. However, this quote I think puts it nicely, probability does not make mistakes, people who use probability make mistakes. That what we're doing is um, trying to understand the frequency in which things happen to be able to approximate reality using statistical tools and different definitions. However, we will also want to recognize the, the fact that um, unlikely events uh, do happen and things that we might have previously thought were unlikely events might change if the system that generates those outcomes change as well. So those are a couple of basic key takeaways from probability theory and the assumptions that are underlying how we actually use it. The next element that I want to talk about is the central limit theorem. And I think this is, is, is one of the fundamental building blocks in trying to connect the sample uh, that we have and the sample values to the central tendency if you get multiple samples from that larger population that helps give us better information about what the average value of the outcome that we care about in the population. Central limit theorem is pretty basic, that the average of the samples, if we were talking about height, if we're talking about um, personal uh, uh, household income, like I mentioned in the beginning, that if you get multiple samples, while that underlying frequency distribution might not be normally distributed, the average values that we take from multiple samples from the population is going to look increasingly distributed in, um, in a normal distribution the larger the sample gets. That as the sample size gets bigger, the distribution of the average values of household income, height, um, um, any other thing that you care to look at is going to look more normal and narrower around that average value. So let's dig into that a little bit more. So the sample size, one of the crucial assumptions is the sample size has to be large. The conventional wisdom that has to be larger numbers of observations. That's why in all of the classes that I, uh, I teach, I try to get as many people to fill out the survey at the end of the term because you do need a large enough number of observations to try to get at the fundamental um, average value of satisfaction in the total population. So if the, the, um, the total population in this case is relatively easy, it's the total number of students in the class. However, you're not getting a random sample of people who choose to respond off it. Obviously, it's, um, it's often the people that are at the extremes. So the larger number of responses you get, the more likely you are going to converge towards that central measure of satisfaction or dissatisfaction. So you have to have a relatively large sample size and that that sample mean of uh, that sample um, you get multiple ones of them, you put them all together, that sample mean will be distributed as roughly a normal distribution uh, around the population mean. This you can actually look at with simulations in which you know what the population mean is in the underlying population, or um, it could be more difficult in a lot of cases in political science, when you don't know what the population mean is, you just want to get at some measure of how confident you can be that the population mean is within a larger range around that sample mean, which we're going to get to in a second.
The third um, is how this is calculated. The sample st a standard deviation around that mean is going to equal the population standard deviation over the square root of the number of sample observations. This is my way of trying to avoid an awkward formula that we're going to get to those um, in a second. So you need the mean and the standard deviation to be, and as well as the sample size to be able to calculate all this. However, the key point I want to try to reiterate is that the sampling distribution is normally shaped, even though the underlying frequency distribution is not normally shaped. So for bringing it back to the die example, each one of the sides of the die have a probability of 0.167 of coming uh, up. So it's a flat distribution, it's a uniform distribution. However, if we come and we roll the, the dice values and we write them down and then you take the average value of all those different values that we throw, let's say 30 times or 100 times, there's going to be a sampling distribution that's going to look increasingly normal of the average value of the die that we roll, likely to between three and four, right? So halfway between the bottom three and the top three as you roll more of them if this is a fair die. However, it doesn't have to be a fair die, and that's the really interesting thing. You could have a biased die in which um, the six is five times more likely to come up than the other five options. And so you're going to have lower probabilities of one through five and a much higher probability for six for any one roll. But if you roll and take the averages of all those rolls 50 or 100 times, that average value of the, the, the numbers that we roll is going to be normally distributed if you have a larger number of observations. We're going to come back to this. Uh, over and, uh, and over again um, because it is useful to try to get at the intuition that the sample mean is distributed normally around and should cluster to include the population mean. This brings me to the normal distribution. This is the standard normal distribution, which has a couple of specific properties that are really useful in trying to calculate confidence intervals and statistical significance. The, the, the important attributes are that the standard normal distribution has a mean of zero and a standard deviation of one, and that all the area under this curve going out as far as you can see, it increasingly gets closer to zero, but the, the area underneath the curve is uh, summing up to, uh, to one, so that 68% of your data should be within one standard deviation, plus or minus around the mean. 95% of your data will be between two standard deviations, and 99.7% of your data will be within three standard deviations. So what are the uh, other populations of the standard normal distribution? It's symmetrical around the mean. You're not going to get a skew one way to the left or to the right. The mean, mode, and median values are all the same, and they're all zero. There's a predictable area under the curve within a specific distance. As I mentioned before, within one standard deviation, it's 68%. However, what I think we'll use more often in political science research is two standard deviations from the mean, which is 95% of the area under that curve is within two standard deviations. We'll come back to this. Fourth, um, skewedness and kurtosis. Skewedness, whether the, the curve is leaning one way or the other is zero because it's symmetrical around uh, zero. And kurtosis, which is how tall uh, or short the, the bell curve is, is also zero. Um, those are outside the scope of what we're talking about here. How do we calculate the standard deviation given that we know what the observations are that we're measuring, let's say, uh, height, and you have you can calculate the average height, right? The mean height that we talked about before is just summing all the different values of it and dividing by the number of different um, observations that you have. Here, the standard deviation is just the sum of those deviations from the average value squared. Uh, over n minus 1, the number of observations that you have. Hopefully, you'll see from this 
with this numerator and denominator. As the denominator, the number of observations get larger. The standard deviation is going to uh, is likely to get smaller, all else being equal with the distribution of the um, the observations from the average value. The standard error is another term you've probably heard of before and is useful when you're trying to calculate uh, confidence intervals. That is basically the standard deviation over the square root of the observations. Uh, so it takes that um, the, uh, the standard deviation that we see here, put it over the number of observations, and that's the standard error of the sample mean, which I know is a mouthful, but if the sample mean is you just take the average of everybody's uh, heights, and then you um, calculate that standard deviation from that according to the previous formula, and then you put that again over the square root of the number of observations, um, that also should get smaller as the number of observations get larger. So what can we do with the standard, uh, standard error? Um, we'll get to that in a second. Um, but this, the, the, I wanted to clearly reinforce the difference between the frequency distribution of just um, how the, the values are distributed by measuring like the number of different die, die throws or exa uh, example. It doesn't have to be normally distributed. You can measure a whole bunch of people's heights and you can have people in year one's heights um, pooled together with people in year 12 and you're not going to get a normally distributed height distribution. You're gonna get a whole bunch of um, little short people as well as other people who are uh, grown and taller. So that frequency distribution doesn't have to be normally distributed uh, in this case of people's heights. However, the, um, the sample mean, if you have keep coming back and get multiple samples of different uh, year ones and different year 12s and different schools, uh, for example, the sample mean, the average height in this case, uh, those values are going to cluster around um, that sample mean in normally distributed fashion. Um, yes, and that's just what I just said. Okay. So what do we, uh, the third element that I wanted to talk about is confidence intervals. And those we'll use both in the statistical um, results that we talk about um, when we use uh, regression uh, or difference of means tests or things like that. Um, but they're also useful when we're trying to understand survey results, a whole bunch of other different things. And in order to calculate the confidence intervals, you basically need some of the things that we've already talked about before. You need to know the number of observations that you have in your sample, the average value of that characteristic that you're looking um, to in that sample, the standard deviation that we just calculated earlier, and the desired confidence interval that we want to select. This, there is, um, a rule of thumb that's often used in a lot of public re, uh, published research of 95% confidence intervals. However, you're also going to see statistical results tables that also look at 99% um, confidence, or if you have a one-tailed test, which is we'll get to later, you can have 90% confidence. Um, you just want to have a confidence that if you have, if you calculate these uh, sample means and the distribution around that with the standard deviation, how confident are you that the true population mean is going to be within a certain range around that sample mean? Because you want to understand the population. We don't have the money to be able to survey everyone in the population, so we have to get a smaller sample, but we want to actually get at the underlying beliefs or outcomes of the underlying population. So we want to, let's say, we want to be 95% confident that the population mean is going to be within a certain range around the sample mean. We use that 95% confidence level. The Z, uh, you can go to uh, a Z table, look at that crucial threshold. 1.96 is that value in this case, and you plug that into the equation here and you get at those lower bounds and upper bounds of the confidence intervals. This is from um, a textbook by Gujarati that shows um, this table in which you calculate um, what threshold you want and what the critical value is that you need to be able to look for.
So the lower confidence interval is just uh, the mean minus the, marger, uh, the margin of error, which we're going to get to in a second. That's often reported in surveys are two standard errors of the mean, which we just uh, calculated. The upper bound is just the same, but in the opposite direction is the mean plus the means margin of error, or those two standard errors of the mean. This is something that I've used uh, in a lot of my research. People will often produce number tables. However, I think people have moved away from just is something statistically significant or not, but actually trying to look at confidence intervals to see how much or how little they overlap before trying to make conclusions that, again, from the beginning, we try to not lie with statistics, but we want to give as much information to the readers to allow them to make their own decisions about whether the relationship that we're talking about is indeed statistically significant. I, so this is an example from a, a paper I published a couple of years ago. I turned the mean uh, or the beta coefficients of the relationship between my independent and dependent variable and then created 95% confidence intervals around them. And I think this is a more intuitive way to see how different variables change in their relationship to the um, dependent variable um, as the independent variables vary in the confidence intervals around them. So those are confidence intervals. In the next video, we're going to be get, we're going to apply this in a couple of different really interesting and creative ways that help us to understand politics and the examples that I actually care about on a day-to-day -day basis. The last thing I want to talk about is expected values and how that connects to probabilities. So if you know the probability of a specific outcome, for me, this made me think about uh, Squid Game. I don't know when season two comes out. I know I won't have time to watch it until after the term. Um, but in season one, the prize uh, was equivalent to around 49 million uh, Australian uh, dollars. And if you wanted to, to calculate what the expected value of that um, prize is, given your probability of actually getting it, you multiply that prize or that outcome by the probability of actually getting it. So you can do that with the, like um, how much you get if you roll a particular value of the die and then you times that by the probability, which here is 1 over 6 or 0.167. You can calculate that uh, yourself to decide whether it's worth uh, playing that game or not. Here, the expected value um, is a lot less than 49 million Australian dollars. The price, of course, is also quite high. If you lose, you lose your life. But the expected value is 107,863 Australian dollars. It's a lot higher. However, it is um, nowhere near the absolute amount of the prize. To try to bring that home a bit more um, viscerally and why a lot of people who study statistics uh, post on social media about how or why they don't play the lottery. It is because you see these big numbers for here. This Thursday's Powerball is $20 million. That sounds great. I could definitely use uh, $20 million. However, if you plug in the expected value of that $20 million times the probability of actually winning that. And I went onto their website and they have to, uh, by law, uh, talk about what the actual odds or the probability of getting the outcome is. The, the probability of winning is 1 in 134 and a half million. So that's incredibly small. It's a whole lot of zeros there in that uh, term. And so the expected value is 15 Australian cents, which is less than the price of the ticket, which is why uh, economists or people who study probability say it's not a rational decision to participate in it because the expected value is less than the known value of actually buying a ticket into it. So this is just another way that we use what we know about probabilities to try to shape our understanding of things that we might care or um, want to understand better in the world. So a couple of quick last minute takeaways about probability. It involves uncertainty, which ties into a lot of what we know about political science. Um, we need estimates of that uncertainty as social scientists because we're often using sample data instead of population data. And so we want to understand the probability that the population values are 
um, relatively near to the sample data that we have to use. These uh, elements that we talked about with probability theory have assumptions, strengths, and weaknesses that I talked a bit about earlier. So you always want to think about those when trying to use different terms, as well as use theoretically what you know about the sample, how it's generated, to try to leverage that kind of qualitative knowledge when you're trying to use quantitative uh, analysis using that uh, that um, uh, that sample data. Lastly, uh, this will be increasingly useful as this term goes on when we try to understand what we mean by statistical significance. But that's a lot to digest. Feel free and go back and rewatch if you have any questions or let me know uh, via email or else if uh, otherwise if you have any questions. And now I'm going to turn to two brief examples of um, probability applied to understanding um, several current political problems. The first one, domestic politics in Australia with the voice referendum that is coming up next month in October of 2023. The second is trying to detect electoral fraud, which is something that people who are, who are conducting electoral fraud obviously don't want to be caught, but there's ways using what we know about probability theory and numbers to be able to try to detect it. So let's go ahead and turn to that now.